We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up. They say it's to protect you while they try to dispossess you of the right to decide between wrong or right. To openly discuss what politicians hide. They wanna keep their secret plans from the public eye. We gotta keep our fire burning, keep our spirits bright. We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up. Rise up, people, against the war. Rise up, people, against the war. Rise up, people, against the war. Rise up, people. Money got no children. And bombs ain't for building. Killing ain't no way to make a peaceful day As all of God's children can easily explain We gotta keep our fires burning, keep our spirits bright Stand up and speak for what we know is right We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up, people, I see days ahead, kiss my children into bed, all across the planet I see that everything is Rise up people against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people. We got the power and the will and we'll do it for our children. Put the warmongers and the corporate whores in the history books with the dinosaurs. I claim my power, I claim my rights. No dirty tricks are gonna change my mind I'm gonna rise up, rise up, rise up I'm gonna rise up, rise up, rise up Rise up people against the war 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 Rise up! Well, welcome to Veterans for Peace Forum. This is uh, Dan Shea, your host, and today we're going to have uh, Michael Crenshaw, uh, well known around the area here in Portland and around the nation where he's performed as Mike M-I-C, Crenshaw. <laughs> um, one of the things I want to do, is this is going to be our last program for uh, this year, uh, is to kind of remind people that over the last year we've covered a number of topics, uh, some of them uh, dealing with veterans coming on the program and talking about their personal experiences. Uh, from Vietnam to uh, World War II, we had Will uh, Poole on here talking about his history as a uh, as a World War II veteran who's still waging peace in this nation and who uh, uh, was an educator and, uh, and his experiences of, in the peace movement, still out there on the streets. So mm -hmm. amazing man. We've had Will, uh, <coughs> Ray Harris uh, who was here talking about a program that he, a uh, documentary that he put out called uh, Authority and Expectations, a uh, very revealing uh, program. I haven't seen such honesty of revealing ones self so much on video, which you can find on YouTube. Just uh, put YouTube in there, Authority and Expectations with Ray Harris, that's W-R-A-Y, and you'll find that program. It's also available on the uh, National Veterans for Peace website that is, gonna, that is offering them as uh, free uh, DVDs to any veteran in the nation that requests it. Uh, that's pretty amazing, and that's been offered by Ken Laurie and Ray Harris, who want no money for the for their <clears throat> this this video they want it to get out they want it to help veterans and they just asked if you have an opportunity to contribute to those organizations that are dealing with veterans uh, and hopefully veterans for peace <laughs> um, uh, the other is is uh, uh, just here uh, a while back uh, 
We had uh, Alicia Jackson on uh, talking about foreclosure. Uh, Mike Crenshaw is also working with We Are Oregon, mm -hmm. and he's been in the forefront of working on that, so we want to cover that topic a little bit. Uh, Mike and I go back, way back, uh, in my college years, and uh, with uh, there were three mentors of mine, which were the Hassan brothers, uh, Abdi Hassan, uh, Mohamud Hassan, and Mo Hassan. Uh, all three of them were co-founders in Education Without Borders, and, um, and Mike, uh, in the very beginning, was out there. He and Taria and Walida yeah. yep. were all out there doing poetry slams and raising money, part of their funds, so it went to help uh, uh, Education Without Borders. Years later, uh, Mike uh, went to Rwanda uh, on a tour in Africa and to deal with the issues of reconciliation among youth um, and formed, uh, co-founded an organization called Global Fam. And uh, this, this network actually raised money to send computers and set up schools for these kids to work on their own uh, issues around uh, reconciliation and educating their people about peace. Um, so th that has become part of Education Without Borders, and Mike is the president right now of Education Without Borders, and I'm going to be, I've been the executive director since its founding in May of 2001. <clears throat> and uh, so what I wanted to do, I'm going to be sort of resigning from that position and uh, allowing these young people to take over. Uh, <laughs> it's time for them to carry on the torch, which they've been doing all along. So it's amazing. And there's another organization that's also under that same umbrella, which is uh, Books to Prisoners. Um, uh, Alex Fish, who's been doing tremendous work of bringing books and sending them to the prisons. Uh, VFP actually raised uh, some money some time back to buy a number of books that went strictly to veterans that are in prison. And not too long ago, I just did a program on uh, um, KBU, uh, the prison pipeline, which mm -hmm. we talked about uh, veterans in prisons. But when I started talking about that, I just happened to be in a book uh, reading group uh, through the Portland Central American Solidarity Committee. And we were reading this book, the, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. I don't know if you can get a close up on that or not. But the, Michelle Alexander uh, will be here in Portland. Uh, I think it is uh, January, let me see if I can get that up here, January 16th. And it's going to be at Emmanuel Temple at 1033 North Summer. There is a uh, contact phone number for that, which is 703-576-6425. I believe that is it, uh, or it's 516-6425. Uh, 23, excuse me, 23. So if you, uh, but if you need more information, actually contact me at uh, my regular email, which is djshea at hotmail.com. And uh, we'll be glad to, I'll gl be glad to tra transfer that information on to you. Um, uh, it's interesting in the book, uh, somebody who wrote the foreword to that is Cornell West. Wow. And Cornell West is also going to be here, and he's going to be yeah. at Portland State University. And if I got that, I just found out it's sold out, but yeah. uh, he is going to be here Tuesday, January 15th at 7 p.m., sold out event. Uh, it's and a recent book that he co-wrote uh, was uh, The Rich and the Rest of Us, uh, Poverty Manifesto. Yeah. Uh, this is incredible stuff, you know. Uh, I think it's very important pe for people to, to pick up this book especially. I think uh, it's talking about the new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. If, I, if I, I just want to come to you on this, you know. A yeah. lot of people when they hear Jim Crow, mm -hmm. they don't even know what that means. It was something that happened after Reconstruction. Right. They don't know what Reconstruction is. Can right. you give a little history here to people? Well, you know, after the Civil War, there, uh, an Emancipation Proclamation, you know, slaves were free to leave the South and to leave the plantations and not be, you know, under the, I guess, the oppression and ownership of their masters anymore. And Jim Crow were, was a set of laws and codes that basically made it legal for mm -hmm. blacks to be ter terrorized and severely limited their social mobility as far as their economic and political power, what they could attain, where they could go, who they could congregate with. So basically, even though slavery was supposedly over, it was almost illegal to be black in the South. And so I think that um, when we look at the Jim Crow, what we're looking at is a systemic kind of oppression. 
So this is something that goes beyond people's beliefs and ideology. Like, you know, somebody can hate somebody or dislike somebody, but when something is actually reinforced by the state and its institutions, the police, the sheriff, um, different political offices, then that's the type that's the type of thing that Jim Crow was. So, mm -hmm. you know, I hear stories. I, I didn't grow up in Jim Crow, you know, but I've definitely dealt with racism. But listening to people f from my my elders generations talk about, you know, there was a, a drinking fountain for white folks and then there was a drinking fountain for black people mm -hmm. um, and so on. Well, and uh, I, w I just did a quick little look because I'm real mm -hmm. bad at dates, you know. So okay. I, I went on Google real quick. And, right. And the Civil War was uh, uh, from April 12th, 1861 to May 9th, 1865. Okay. Reconstruction, of course, was a time in which blacks were freed from mm -hmm. their masters and mm -hmm. were actually running for Congress and being mm -hmm. a part of the society. They were, they were enfranchised. Uh, for the right to vote, which right. happened in 1867. Uh, so it's Jim Crow is somewhere from 1863 to 1877. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the North pulled out the troops out of the South. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they pulled those troops out, it was basically a deal between the, the Democrats and the Repu or the Republicans with the Southern Democrats to basically say, you know, we. Um, uh, we'll get, we'll pull all the troops out, and we'll leave you alone if you, as long as we can still elect a, a president in our mm -hmm. name. Mm -hmm. And that deal was struck. And but when they did that, uh, the South felt, you know, I mean, they were looking at their plantation economy had been disrupted, and their privilege had been disrupted. Right. And they began to look at the 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 price of how were they going to re indenture and enslave people. Right. And one of the things they began to do was to create what they call, you know, this <clears throat> Jim Crow, Jim mm -hmm. Crow laws. You couldn't be out after a certain time. Mm -hmm. uh, vagrancy laws happened to happen, uh, become uh, uh, where you didn't have any money. For, they, they Basically, they criminalized poverty. Right. And they could pick somebody up, put them in prison, and put them in a chain gang, and then hire them out to the plantation. So they re-enslaved people right. through these laws and took away rights. And people struggled for a long time. And then the civil rights course movement came along and mm -hmm. uh, took those those matters that are still uh, on the books, but have were you know uh, segregation was mm -hmm. uh, an issue. Certain laws that come in, uh, Brown versus uh, was it the Board of Education? Board of Education, and so when that happened, we had uh, you know we have the civil rights movement that takes us a movement forward. She talks about the civil rights movement as a movement. Mm -hmm. And as the movement begins, uh, you know, and, and wins, and Martin Luther King is starting to expand that idea between uh, his criticism of the Vietnam War, right. powerful speech, yeah. uh, and uh, his uh, call for the, the, <clears throat> the Poor People's March, mm -hmm. and standing up with the uh, labor in the, uh, uh, the, what was it, the Jenners or the Garbage Men's strike, right, right. And, uh, and then was assassinated to cut off the head of this movement right. and again segregate people from each other and the idea that this is an all people's movement. That, I think that's a really important point, Dan. I think that a <clears throat> lot of civil rights, which are really human rights and justice, um, that should be granted all humans mm -hmm. equally in a civil society. Right. Um, I think <clears throat> a lot of times it gets cloaked in a racial um, kind of veneer um, or facade, but I, I think that ultimately what's so threatening about the civil rights movement is the potential of it to unite all people. That's right. And create this class consciousness across the board that would be kind of reflective of what we would call the 99%. Right. And going back to Jim Crow, when most whites in the South were poor too, That's okay? Right. Very small percentage of whites were were rich landowners and slave, slave owners. And one of the things that Jim Crow sought to do was prevent the poor sharecroppers, be they black or white, from coming together. Mm -hmm. And so people were, it, it was illegal for people to congregate. If it wasn't illegal, then the Klan was there to terrorize. That's right. Not only black folks, but poor white folks who might have found common interests That's right. with those black folks. So, That's yeah. right. And the and they call she called it the racial bribe. 
Mm -hmm. The racial yep. bribe was, well, you still have your white skin. Yeah. You still are better than. And then they create this idea the of illusion, racial superiority. Yeah, the right? illusion of inclusion, <laughs> I've heard it called. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and they, and yeah. they talked about it. Uh, she In the very beginning, she mm -hmm. talks about it as uh, f sort of the first construction mm -hmm. of it came with uh, the colonial uh people coming in and having mm. to take land from the Native Americans. Right. Uh, the language was the language of uh, those savages. You know, right. They're less than human. So they, you know, I mean, you don't take land away from the, the, your next door neighbor, but these people are savage. You have every right. So they had, they started using language as a way to give themselves privilege and take away human rights from right. uh, another being a, <clears throat> that was in the same geographical area. And then we, we began to look at that. So what does she mean by the new Jim Crow? Well, you know, I think I have the book and I haven't had the opportunity to read it. I'm excited about the book because it deals with these things that we're talking about, that she talks about, that we're all experiencing, that right. affect all of our lives, That's you know? Right. And so, you know, when I look at how, how does the new Jim Crow affect me, I want to say that, you know, in the spirit of what we're talking about, it's important to understand that racism is real, okay? That's right. So when I talk about class and economics, I'm not trying to take away, I'm not trying to soften the blow of racism, but what I want to, to clarify and, and, and reinforce is that race was created, our modern concepts of race was created to justify a certain kind of capitalism. That's and right. that the two go hand in hand, and that the racism justifies the dehumanization of people, be it the Native Americans or blacks in Africa or slaves that came over here That's or right. up to today, you know, um, people in Central Asia, people in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan, it justifies a certain ruling class going in, destabilizing people, killing people, and taking control of the resources. Yeah, we, I th and I think most people understand that, but what right. I think is critical about this book uh, uh -huh. that, that is so important is that she, you know, that we know that they enslave people. We know right. there's a drug war that's gone after blacks more than whites in, right. in, in our society. We have the largest prison population in the, in the world. Okay. And, uh, but what, how, how did they do this? I mean, she begins to talk about mm. how you know, we had moved, the civil rights movement took us to a, a certain level. People began to say, you know, we're not, you know, I'm not, uh, we didn't use the language of race. The courts actually wouldn't allow you to even bring up race in these cases that they were bringing against people, even when it was obvious, because of course we're not racist. They started to criminalize people by uh, uh, labeling them a felon. Yeah. Uh, so they, they created laws, especially on minor drug offenses, that with three, three strikes you're out, you're in prison for the rest of your life. Or if you're uh, uh, on parole for the rest of your life. But as a felon, you begin, you're denied uh, the right to uh, 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 grants and education, a right to food stamps, a right to vote. Right. All these various rights are taken away. Therefore, the new Jim Crow exactly. that disenfranchised right. people again. But it's not racist because we don't use that word. They're a criminal, and it's right. all right to take those rights away. Of course, because people. we have to make the streets safer. That's you know, yeah. um, whether it was the war on drugs, okay. There's a lot of interesting things going on right now. Um, the war on drugs is being seen by a lot of the public and even some people that make policy in law enforcement are coming out and publicly saying it's a failure. Okay, they're sure. saying that the money that we've spent to criminalize people, lock up nonviolent offenders and keep them housed in these prisons is, is a huge waste of money. But we also know it funds a certain level of the police state that provides a lot of jobs for people that have an interest in continuing this type of thing. Right. But you have this population of mostly young black Latino males who've been disenfranchised, who are back out here sometimes. Some, a lot of them are still locked up, mm -hmm. but you got people transitioning who don't have the same kind of access to opportunities, mm -hmm. okay? The people that don't have that criminalization, that felony have, okay? Right. So it's harder for them to, I, I hate to use this term, but it's harder for them to be productive members of society. So what happens to that population? What choices are they left with in order to make a living? 
Okay. Well, and they're in debt also. And they're, that, in yeah. a lot of states, you have to pay for your time in jail. Right. You have to pay for the court fees. Right. This is the old, uh, you know, what do they call it? The uh, uh, um, when you were in, working in, a, in, a, let's say, the mines, you had to pay for the shovel, the company store. Yeah, the company you to, store. You had to pay for the the very things that you you ate, slept. Uh, they they had all of these things, and by the time you got your wages, it was deducted. You had nothing. You had nothing. <laughs> so you had to get up and keep breaking rocks or that's, whatever. Right. That's right. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. I mean, the struggle. Mm. There's an idea. Of, I was just listening to a program talking about. Um, uh, they're glorifying the the the. I was watching it on television before mm. we came here. It was uh, on the history of of uh, America, the progress of the nation. And it was going back to the colonial days uh, uh, coming into this country and how mm -hmm. certain people, uh, I, I think I wrote down what, I, what, she, what he said, they, they had to sort of, when they were trying to uh, convince people to give them money to go to the colonies, gold was a big thing, you know, we were gonna, the greed was one of the things, but stacking the advantages whether in war or land and sea or in business, you know? Right. We got to stack those advantages. Well, how do you do that? That means you monopolize a certain amount of power. You, you uh, in today's corporate world, mm -hmm. you bribe, mm -hmm. I call it bribe, yeah. give money to your politicians to give you the advantage to take right. and exploit other people. Right. And that gives them power over you. Mm -hmm. So they're, when they talk about free market, I don't see a free market. I no, see one that is totally yeah. out of balance and gives uh, 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 great weight to those that already have. What free market means in my mind is lack of regulation for the people who are the most predatory. Right. You know, and the people who can afford to be the most predatory and do the most damage are the people with the most capital. And they got that capital by being brutal. And they're gonna continue to be, to be able to do what they do unregulated, like this bank, what is it, HSBC or HBSC, that I've been hearing about lately. Some Swiss bank that basically got busted oh, yeah. for laundering um, something like 90 million in, in drug money. Right, right. You know, and they, don't, they, they didn't get a conviction. Right. You know, so these people that do this walk free. And if you think about it, the amount of lives that are affected by that type of rampant, unregulated behavior, in free market capitalism, you know, it's it, you really can't calculate it. But then you got guys who are going away five, ten years on nonviolent drug offenses. Um, so yeah, I know I'm all over the place. No, it's, no, it's, you're it's, <clears throat> you're right on there. I mean, and again, you know, I think this is the movement, the civil rights movement was a nonviolent movement, right? And it had power. Yeah. You know? And I'm with Veterans for Peace, which is a nonviolent movement you know, right. that says we need to end war and we whenever we're struggling we need to make sure that violence isn't a part of our culture mm -hmm. uh, these are the things uh, and a recent thing that we just saw I think we <clears throat> we got to recognize that we just had a shooting in the mall here in Oregon right uh, <clears throat> and we had uh, and then you have uh, Newtown right and, and uh, where what was it 20 some odd kids about 78 years old yeah. uh, you know were were slaughtered and massacred uh, and we have a new language about, you know, uh, gun control. Uh, and I like, uh, you know, I'm not a great fan of uh, Mayor mm -hmm. Bloomberg but in New York, but he, he reframed that word uh, uh, control to reasonable, sensible regulation. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's what people have to start looking at. We need to say, well, what are we afraid of? And one of my veterans friends, you know, we were arguing over various things about people's rights. Uh, and he said, you know, that they did a, there's a book out there mm -hmm. that uh, uh, has looked at war from the beginning to, uh, uh, to the present wars, from the civil rights, uh, I mean, uh, civil war to uh, mm -hmm. uh, now. And it has shown that, uh, that nonviolence has won more victories, double uh, than a violent revolution. Good. And that is, there's an examples out there. Some of those examples, of course, are in Latin America right now. Okay. We see that happening. We mm -hmm. saw it with uh, the apartheid movement in South mm -hmm. Africa, uh, which kind of brings us back when we start talking about uh, you're going to be going on this tour to Africa. And mm -hmm. just before we get there, I want to go back. We, like I said, okay. we, we had talked with uh, Alicia Jackson at Foreclosure. Uh, and you are working, and she's a veteran too, which I she found is. out when yeah. you know we, when I asked her to come here. Uh, and we're having veterans, and we're having people struggling to stay in their homes. Another way for the poor that are being uh, 
uh, pushed out of uh, a decent living and an opportunity to, to house their, their people because of the speculation in the capitalist market that pushes people out. But we are Oregon, you're working with them. Yes. And they're doing a lot to fight back on this. Could you tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. <clears throat> where Alicia is right now and uh, some of the other people that have? Alicia's still in her house. Um, I was just over there two nights ago doing a shift and I've been playing an active role in supporting the, the need to fill shifts at her house. So we have people house sitting there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the reason that we do that is because the city uh, refused to turn her water on. And they said that if she didn't vacate her premises um, within a certain amount of time that they would they would issue a vacate order and that the city could then city workers could then show up with the Portland Police Bureau and um, forcefully evict anyone from her property as well as board it up so that nobody could enter it. And then from that point on, they would uh, be able to go back at any time to execute another vacate order without a warrant. So we're taking a stand and we're saying, A, leave Alicia alone, let her property be hers because she's the rightful owner of it. Um, she was swindled out of it illegally, um, unjustly, and so she decided to take it back and, and move back in her house. She's been there since May 1st. And B, turn her water on because she went to the city and she said, this is the amount of money I would owe. You know, when she initially left her house, she thought she wouldn't be there anymore. Um, she didn't realize she had a right to stay. But upon doing a lot of self-educating and talking to people who supported her in her struggle, she found out actually she legally had the right to ownership and live Same in her state. property. Yeah. And so, but in that, in that interim period when she left, the water lapsed. She didn't keep up with the bill. So since she's been back in, she's tried to go back and pay the water bureau the amount she would owe, and they refused to accept it. So at this point, it's, it's really not a practical issue of economics as much as it is a political issue mm -hmm. and that they don't want this woman, this veteran, this black woman, this working class woman, this citizen of this country who works for the city, they don't want her to have her property. They don't want her to have a right to have running water in her property. So, and what, it's all, what, what excuse are they giving for that? Uh, they said that she can't prove that the property is hers. So, this is one of these things that... Well, whose is it then in, in there? Well, mind? it's hers. Yeah. <laughs> it is hers, it. right. Yeah. And so they, there's, a, there's a developer by the name of Fox Capital that took over her property, built the duplex on her property, and is currently... And I think sold that duplex to someone else, and there are currently people in, that, in there. So this, was, this is a case of... Alicia is just one example, mm -hmm. you know, working with We Are Oregon doing the for right. housing justice foreclosure right. defense work. There are a lot of people. There are 4,000 people facing foreclosure in Multnomah County, first 4, of all. 4,000. In Multnomah wow. County, in one county, yes. okay? Um, Alicia is one of many who are standing up and, and publicly fighting back and saying, you know what, this, this bubble happened. Banks got bailed out, you know. Who knows how much they really got bailed out? I think it was something like uh, seven hundred billion or something crazy back when mm -hmm. I heard about that a few years ago. And um, and to this day, these banks are still getting bailed out for all the speculative failure that they created, which was basically people trying to create money out of thin air, mm -hmm. you know. And in the process, a lot of people got screwed over and are facing foreclosure. I, it's complicated. Um, it's not that easy for me to explain, but I'm going to stand on the side of working people. Right. And I'm going to listen to the stories that I hear of people who are not criminals, who are doing everything they can to keep their homes. They're on time. They made their payments. Mm -hmm. But what happened in many cases is somebody lost a job and somebody got sick. I can't tell you how common that is. Mm -hmm. When I say sick, I'm talking about cancer. OK, I'm mm -hmm. talking about diabetes. I'm talking about the type of thing that will throw all your economic <clears throat> security off. And in those circumstances, the banks are refusing to work people and the banks are even doubling down on their efforts to kick people, sick people out in the street.
Yeah. And so we're here, we're part of not only a local movement, but really a national movement right. and ultimately a global movement to be like, it's too much. This has got to stop. You right. know, working people need to be housed. Housing is a human right. And beyond that, people who, not just homeowners, people who are tenants who are in precarious positions, who are struggling, need, they have a right to be housed. People who are houseless, who are on the street, mm -hmm. need to be, they have a right to housing. Whether they choose to be in housing or not, we as a society have a responsibility to make sure they're housed. People down here in Right to Dream, Randy Leonard on his way out, gone. But get off their back, quit charging them this all this money every month for them trying to be responsible and take care of themselves. Well, I noticed even for myself. I mean, I was just here um, just before my paycheck here the other day. Okay. I, you know, I went to even pay parking and I had my card dot got declined. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I checked my bank and I had $10 in the, my account. I don't have savings. You know, I'm a Vietnam veteran and I had... Uh, Struggled most of my life. <clears throat> I'm still in uh, student debt. Uh, I owe about twenty thousand, right? Nearly that much. And I paid off fifty thousand. So, <clears throat> but you know, and I haven't paid for a while. It's like every time I turn around, car goes out. Uh, I can't get to work. Uh, you know, you got to eat sometimes. And once in a while, you got to have some. You know, you got to have some fun. You got to go right. with somebody. Uh, uh, go out. Uh, you want to you want to pay the bill for somebody else once in a while. You right. know, it's your dignity is mm -hmm. at stake in these things, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know I, I'm tr I'm telling people here this, and a lot of people won't tell how hard it is for them because it's an embarrassment. You know, uh, you should be able to make it. But I remember when I was working in a union job and uh, the pr uh, I was a pressman, and uh, in the printing industry. You know, I was making good wages. I worked a seven-hour day. I got mm -hmm. time and a half. Uh, for weekends or even uh, time and a half for uh, or anything over seven hours. Uh, that was supposed to be the future as we we're moving in. And, and as time went on, of course, technology came in, um, things that cost a million dollars to produce uh, something that you could print on this page, you know, in the film. Uh, now you can do it on a laptop on a Mac, you know. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, people lost their jobs in this process, but nobody prepared anybody for that expansion. Everybody, manufacturing jobs either got shipped out or mm -hmm. became so automated that people lost their jobs and everybody's in the service industry of some right. sort or another. Well, those jobs don't pay much. Right. And for me, it's not that I, I couldn't do more, you know. I'm highly educated. Um, uh, I have a lot of other resources that I could have done. It's, I'm also a veteran and uh, I'm uh, somebody who can't work for the major corporations in, in this world anymore because they all seem to be equally connected to the military industrial complex in one shape or form or another or their, their money is invested in it. And for me that becomes a serious problem and I can't work for them. I just literally become ill. Yeah. And so I take, I work for a nonprofit that distributes music in the world. I don't want to say too much on television, but mm -hmm. you know. But the main thing is, is uh, working for a nonprofit. Uh, I feel like I'm giving something back. I don't make much money. My wife is the breadwinner, but I come that close to not being able to make my mortgage payment each month. And if I wasn't a veteran uh, um, with some disability uh, payments, I probably couldn't make it. And I'd be out there on the streets with somebody else. And that's, that's the story. That's are. everybody I know story, Dan. Yeah. You know, I know, I know some people that are, most folks I know are working class. And when I say working class, I mean people who do everything they can to stay on top. But they're, they're really close to right. losing it all the time. And I know some people that are middle class, which is really working class too. Right, it is. Um, but they have, they, the, they appear to have a lot. But they're trying to hold on to it. They're about right. to lose it, you know. That's and right. so I think it's time for people to not be afraid that what they're going through it has to be shameful. That's right. And to stand up and say, you know, I'm going through this. I'm not alone. Right. And I'm going to stand with my neighbor. I'm going to stand with my my coworker, you know, my comrade, and and take a stand and put. We're going to put our feet down and be like, look, man, if you guys, here's the problem. All the scarcity that they're talking about, the fiscal cliff and all this right. manufactured hype. If you're spending you. hundreds of billions every year on the military industrial complex, complex, 
there's a lot of money. And there's the prison a, industrial and complex. And the prison industrial yeah. complex. There's a lot of money that can be redistributed. That's right. And, you know, it's don't get me started. I mean, jobs, it's like the ecological crisis that we're facing because of industrial mm -hmm. capitalism, because mm -hmm. of the military industrial complex, That's which right. is one of the biggest polluters on earth. How about we create jobs where people, everybody is put to work cleaning up that mess so that there is a future for young people so that they can breathe the air and drink the water? Well, I saw, I saw some, you know, and we all go back and look at the WPA programs that came out of the Roosevelt era. Uh -huh. This is what the, I would say, the 1% is, is strategically uh, came together to say we want to get rid of that, uh, that social program, you know. Yeah. Uh, and a sort of right-wing movement and think tanks came in to plan over time to whittle away at it. And even with... Um, President Obama, uh, who's uh, fighting to supposedly fighting to uh, save us from going over this uh, uh, fiscal <laughs> cliff, uh, he's talking about uh, mm. negotiating uh, away parts of Social Security. You know, of course, this has, and Social Security has nothing to do with the deficit. Uh, these are the kinds of things that people have to take a look back at. But I, I remember, I, I think it was. Uh, an economist uh, named Wolf. I don't know. If Richard Wolf. Richard Wolf, yeah. who was talking about when uh -huh. when uh, uh, Roosevelt did it, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He actually went, he, you know, to the the community because he came from wealth, mm -hmm. and he went to that community. He was uh, part of the privileged club at that time, and he says, "Look, you know, after the bonus march when the when the uh, servicemen came back from." World War One and, and said, hey, we, we need our bonuses now yeah. in order to survive. And uh, they had MacArthur and others, you know, kill all a bunch of people on the ship, take them off, uh, uh, <clears throat> off the lawns of the uh, White House area. Uh, he, um, he said, we need to build something or we're going to, you know, uh, <laughs> your lives are at stake. And I'm not sure we can take care of you guys. Right. So he said, you got to give us, you got to give me the money. It wasn't taxes. Mm -hmm. He paid for the whole thing. No taxes were produced. Well, the rich paid to keep people the peace. Yeah. And uh, now, and then, you know, I mean, we had taxes on the rich. We were up to 90%. And now we're down to what, below what an average worker makes. So the money is there. It's a shift of money back and forth one way or the other. One of the things that I think is important is that you're in the struggle. You have been in the struggle since I've known you. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in the struggle <laughs> since, mm -hmm. since we've been together. Right. Um, I think I'm, I'm a labor activist. I think labor needs to come back and be strong. And a, a fine example of fight back is the teachers in Chicago. Right. You know, uh, they went over the heads of their union leaders. They created their own. Uh, 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 wildcat strike among themselves and uh, took over their union mm -hmm. and fought for the old ways of doing things, which was like the civil rights movement, which right. was like the strike movements. Those mm -hmm. things won. Yeah. We have to go back and see what wins and why. And I found for myself is that, you know, we, we had millions of people in the street to try and stop the war. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have any consequences. After the march, people went home. Right. Well, when you do a strike, you don't go home. Yeah. You don't produce. And when you don't produce, they don't make money. Right. You have to have consequences. And I think that's one of the things that I think we need to get back in this nation when we bring people together. We have to, you know, you can have simple demands, even one demand. But yeah. you have to make sure that people are going to stand there. And what I love about mm -hmm. what you guys are doing mm -hmm. with Alicia and other people, because it's not just Alicia, as you right. said, there are other uh, members. Uh, in fact, one of the ladies where I work was doing massage, mm. and uh, we were talking. And I just mentioned, you know, I had this program, and we had Alicia, and she says, "Oh, I know Alicia, okay, because they foreclosed on me." Mm. <laughs> well, wow. that's how close. Is she it resisting? Is. Yes, okay. she's resisting. She's in the movement. So, good, good. You know, I mean, this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, you don't realize how close it is around you, all around you, all and around people you. need to start talking about it and being in the front. That's why I'm glad we have alternative media mm -hmm. so that we can uh, bring these things to the table. We, we need to use our own uh, media. You know, it's important. The, 
the mainstream media is so pervasive and, and powerful yeah. in that it's everywhere. Like when I grew up, um, we got a lot done, but we didn't have computers and email. Right. I mean, certain people in certain sectors of society that were technologically based did, but we as kids didn't, and uh, we didn't have cell phones. And so we still organized and we still communicated, we still mobilized. We let's, st talk, let's talk about that. You okay. were you, you, uh, born in uh, Chicago? Right? Born in Chicago, um, wound up in Minneapolis during my teenage years, and um, lived there for a number of years, and then I moved out here. Um, in my 20s, but while I was in Minneapolis. Your brothers and sisters? Yes, I have, my immediate family lives here. I have an older brother, younger sister. Uh -huh. yeah. So, And so yeah. while you were there, you said you were we organizing? Were, we were organizing. Um, Anti-racist action was something that we created that moved on to become a national, ultimately international organization. Um, basically, youth from all different backgrounds that were that organized the fight against neo-Nazis and fascism. Um, I read something in your mm -hmm. bio, something about the Baldies, what was Yeah, what Minneapolis was Baldies. So we were, we identified as skinheads, we were anti-racist skinheads. Ah, okay. Minneapolis Baldies were pre-sharp, sharp as skinheads oh, yeah. against I racial know. prejudice, yeah. but we needed to name ourselves something that differentiated us from sharp. It also differentiated us from the term skinhead because we knew that in the climate at the time, people didn't understand that all skinheads were not racist. Right. Um, but because a lot of the talk shows, Donahue, Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and on so forth, uh, put all these examples of skinheads on television that were all Nazis and right. all racist. And so people thought that all skinheads were racist. So that was something we did to kind of name ourselves something that, that represented what we were, but was also different. And in American culture, the Baldies are an old subcultural set of gangs that went back into the 50s mm -hmm. anyway. And so that was our way of kind of reclaiming that for ourselves. But it was a, uh, you know, eventually I found my way into respecting nonviolent forms of struggle. But at that time, it was a violent struggle. Right. Because we felt the only way to engage with violent people was to fight fire with fire. Right. And these guys were running around justifying attacking people of color. You know, the Klan is a terrorist organization. The leader right. of one of the gangs that we had a rivalry with was a Klansman. Um, he went on the evening news and said he was a Klansman. Right. And so we felt we had to mobilize. And we were youth. We were 15. You know, everybody at that time was between like 15 and 19 years old. And, right. But that movement is still around today. Oh, um, yeah. No, I remember, I mean, one of the things that... Uh, we all came around was the rock against racism, right? You know, I mean, uh, Mugalata Sara, yep. who was beaten by uh, racist skinheads uh, to death, and and right. my uh, mentors, who I mentioned, Abdi Hassan and his brothers, right. uh, were the first ones to bring it to the attention that this was not just an isolated incident, mm. and and worked with other groups to create the rock against racism. Mm. That first amount of money that they raised from that created the. Uh, uh, was it uh, the coalition for human dignity? The, yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, so you had all of this these things that were um, uh, started uh, because people said, no, this is this racism uh, uh, on this violent mode is something that we cannot accept. And uh, Metzger trial came out mm -hmm. of that whole thing after right. a while. Uh, Metzger was uh, uh, sort of the leader of war who propagandized his. Uh, uh, Nazi and uh, uh, white supremacist message through uh, social media and right. other forms, uh, <coughs> through cable TV. Yep. And, and so those kinds of things, uh, he was eventually sued out of the money to be able to continue doing that. Yeah. Uh, but still, a man lost his life, right. and uh, other people have too. Yeah. Um, there is um, there's something about what. What you were, there's another way of that of reaching out to people, and that's been through music and right. poetry and, you know, uh, the hip hop movement. And that whole hip hop language is, is, was something, a way of spreading a message, too. Right. And you were at, at, here in Portland, at least, were at the core of mm -hmm. a lot of that happening uh, um, with so many people. And, and uh, you're still here and you're still yeah. doing it. And you're planning on doing a, uh, African hip hop caravan. That's right. And you're talking about going to six African cities. That's right. And what are, what are the cities? That you Cape Town, South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa, Harare, Zimbabwe, Nairobi, Kenya, 
Dakar, Senegal, and Tunis, Tunisia. And when we, it starts February 11th, we do a week in each city. Mm -hmm. and then we wind up at the World Social Forum in Tunisia. And I mean, how appropriate to uh, end up mm -hmm. in Tunisia where the beginning of the Arab, the Arab Spring, Spring, you that's know? Right. Yeah. Uh, and that, I mean, it's powerful. I mean, have you been to a World Social Forum before? I never have. I've only been to two U.S. social forums. forums it's yeah. been a, a dream of mine since I heard about them, you That's know, great. years ago. And so this will be my opportunity to go and to be able to do it in an organized effort. You know, when we do the African Hip Hop Caravan, we're going to be engaging um, 120 cultural workers, activists, educators, and organizers mm -hmm. on the ground in, in every city. Right. And their vast network of, of youth and community members that they work with. So, you know, really uh, thousands of people are going to be, be part of this effort to take what they're already doing, their modes of cultural expression and their, you know, their forms of hip hop and, and their forms of dance and, and painting and poetry and kind of build this movement that's already kind of there, but mm -hmm. we just want to we want to bring some cohesiveness to it. And, and being able to share that at the World Social Forum, I think they're expecting like 100,000 people there. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I just wanted to point out to people, we do have uh, Global Fam uh, uh, <clears throat> website up here, and uh, the, uh, uh, it's the Indigo, uh, you know, just a sort of a funding uh, uh, shot, if a you crowdfunding would. crowdfunding Indiegogo <laughs> yeah. thing for the Hip Hop Caravan. So those uh, sites are can up I on give the screen. My, can I give my email in a little? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to contact me and uh, talk about housing justice and maybe doing some shifts at one of the numerous houses we're defending, you can do so at uh, Crenshaw, C-R-E-N-S-H-A-W-3-3 at gmail.com. And throughout repeat it, the repeat it one more time. Crenshaw thirty three. Crenshaw C R E N S H A W the number thirty three at gmail dot com. And um, email me and I'll I'll let you know about what's going on. We're also gonna be doing six fundraisers in mm -hmm. January. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are gonna be private parties at, at people's residences, but there's gonna be one at the uh, first Friday Zulu Jam on first and salmon. Mm hmm on January 4th, and there's going to be another one open to the public at The No on uh, January 26th, up on like 19th in Alberta. So I, I, I want to be, get this in before we get closing here, too, uh -huh. is that um, there is a, a movement uh, that, you know, I just found out about on, mm -hmm. on, on Facebook. The guy sent me a picture of the Zapatistas, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, this huge crowd, and I'm going, what the heck is this? When was this? Because there was no date, no nothing, you mm -hmm. know. And and they said, what's going on right now? There's another one in Canada. And there's all these movements going on all over the world. And, of course, the world was supposed to end, you know. <laughs> right, 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 right. Right? And what it is is idle no more. There's a flash mob. This is Native American, indigenous people all around the world are coming out. And uh, there's a flash Man. mob uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. at Pioneer Courthouse Square. Okay. Uh, this is a movement, you know, of uh, international uh, indigenous people's movement. Th that's right. Okay. And you can go on uh, online. We've uh, got some information up there on the screen. Go to Facebook, uh, look it up. Uh, you'll okay. find out. I mean, I don't know enough. You know, I just all of a sudden I've seen millions and thousands and thousands of I people love, here, and I'm going, "Oh, wow! This is the way it needs to be." I know? love finding out about social movements. <clears throat> For, for liberation and justice that I haven't heard about yet, yeah. especially when there's thousands of people involved. Yeah. Because it lets me know that this thing that we're doing is bigger than we can imagine, That's and it's right. constantly growing. And I think that, that uh, there's this metaphor that I have from when I was a child and I was watching the Holocaust mm -hmm. on the miniseries about the Jews in, in Nazi Germany and World War II, and there was these people that were being put onto these boxcars and being shipped off to concentration camps. And I was looking at it and there would only be a couple of armed guards per like, you know, 175 to 150 people that were on the boxcars. And I always thought, how come they don't overtake the guards? Maybe right. a couple people will get hurt, but ultimately they out, they far out here. number. Same and it's here. the same thing. And, <laughs> and I think, you know, with all these people we have on earth, there's like close <laughs> to 7 billion people, you know, there, we, I feel like we have a fighting chance, man. Well, I think so, too. I think, yeah. uh, you know, the movement uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. raised the, 
the real issue, the 1% versus the 99%. That yeah. gives the reality of who we are. Right. And uh, this needs to change. We need to turn the tables on that. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it's important for people to realize in, in educating yourselves, uh, don't always believe the so-called authorities, you know, challenge mm -hmm. those ideas. And, uh, and that's a self-education is probably the best thing you can do. Yeah. Uh, keep learning, keep finding out about stuff with social media that we have available to us before they destroy it. Uh, you know, yeah. you can find out almost anything you need to find out and mm -hmm. you gotta be able to wade through uh, the truth in that, but you, you start reading and, and uh, mm -hmm. doing the research, you'll learn. I think too, you know, I wanted to <clears throat> just raise an issue. We had, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Ann Wright was here just a while ago and <clears throat> she went to Gaza, you know, she was uh -huh. on one of the flotillas. There's a book out there called Freedom Sailors by Edith Berlin and Bill Deist, uh, MD doctor. That was, uh, that book there is about uh, uh, Gaza and the Palestinian. There's an apartheid system also in, uh, from Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to put up again the uh, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And like I said, she's going to be here uh, January uh, 15th. And then uh, um, uh, Cornell West also going to be here, but looks like it's sold out. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, these these are people that are all putting this these messages out there. These books are important for educating uh, yourself. I'm reading a new book. Um, on, uh, it's called The Operators, The Wild and a Terrific Inside Story of uh, America's War in Afghanistan by Michael Hastings. Uh, now, this is about uh, uh, Gen Major General uh, uh, Stanley McChrystal in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. I think if I got his title right. But McChrystal, uh, it's sort of uh, the Rolling Stones article. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the author that wrote it. It's kind of the inside story. And when you start reading about these people in their lives, you start wondering about this mix of people and you see them, their personalities, and you say, these are the people that are running the war? Yeah. Because they're nuts. They're, well, <laughs> they're nuts. Obviously. I <laughs> and, mean, yeah. And you, you, you say, hey, you know, can, they are no smarter than you are. Can, can uh, I add something to that? I think, you know, in the wake, and I don't want to beat this thing um, and be too redundant, but in the wake of these, all these mass shootings, some locally, all over the country, you, those don't happen in a vacuum. No. You can't, talking about chickens coming home to roost, how can you have a military industrial complex that wages war on every region of the earth and over militarizes people, you know, um, to the point where the entertainment, every every blockbuster movie is full of violence and some simulation right. of war in the video games. How can you have that level of violence promoted in society and, and carried out globally without people doing things like that? Right. There's no way you can't. It is the example. I mean, if you, I mean, how do you how do we learn from as kids? We learn mm -hmm. by example. Right. We if our parents are just and teach us, you know, we learn, or we learn from our friends if we have parents that have problems. You know, right. we learn from our friends that are doing good things. But when you have a government that says that the only way to solve a problem is through violence, is through violence, what do you expect the young people to do? No, man. And they give you no resources to, to advance peacefully in this world. No. Yeah, you've taught violence. And yeah. we, need, we need to end war. I mean, that's the position of Veterans for Peace. You right. know? We need to end war as a national policy. And uh, our goal is, to, is the abolition of war. Yeah. It's a grand idea, but I think with the right amount of people, it's possible. I want you mm -hmm. to do a little hip-hop. For okay, us, so yeah. do, do one of do your poems poem because here. I think, you know, you okay. say it so well. Okay. My, 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 what a time to be alive. Give thanks to the most high I have survived. The moment we've been waiting for has arrived. Now is the time and the power is mine. I am confident that we are cosmic, more than consumers, commodities, and objects, birthed to death, indebted, held hostage. Taxed under attack, break your back in the process. Assigned a race. What is race but a construct you did not create that permeates your conscious, divided by hate? 
in a race is a contest, race to the bottom in the name of progress. In the context of a conquest of a military industrial prison complex in the era of a war on terror where genocide is justified by suicide bomb threats. To lobby in the Congress, corporations conned us. Now the giant is awake, defiant, and responsive. I have scientific faith that I will not be conquered, decolonize the mind occupied by conflict. Amen. Now that said it Thank all. You. That's what we were talking about. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, bump on that, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's the kind of thing. Now you are mm -hmm. a father. Yes. Your wife is a wonderful singer also. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, your daughter now is how old? Two and a half. Two and a half. And now I have an older daughter that's 20. She just turned 20. 20. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, what's it feel like to be a parent in, in this world right now? Well, you know, I, I just love looking at my kid because, you know, being a parent, there's nothing like watching your kid enjoy life and grow and be as intelligent as children are when... They're just reflecting the world around them, taking it all in. However, I'm a little concerned about the world that we've left for our shorties. Right. So we, we got a lot of work to do, and we got to stand with them and, and try to make things better. And I think, too, one of the things, I'm a grandfather now, and being mm -hmm. a grandfather, what I love is looking at the world through the eyes of a child because right. they see uh, a wonder out there, and we should be able to see that. Let's not pollute it with more pollution and war and violence. And yeah. I want to thank people for coming to this program and watching us. Uh, for those people who didn't have an opportunity, we'll put this up on YouTube for you. And come back and see us next year. Have happy holidays. Mike, thank you so much for coming out. Thank uh, you, Dan. You've been there for me for so long. I want to be there for you. Right on, Dan. Brother. Right on. <laughs>